Hey, listeners, if you have story suggestions, news tips, corrections, or comments on anything we discuss on our show, please contact us by commenting on our Facebook page, facebook.com slash 1PVS2P, on Twitter at 1PVS2P underscore podcast, or by emailing us, podcast at 1PVS2P.com. You can also record a voicemail or send us a text to 571-418-GAME. That's 571-418-4263. Record or write in, and we might just read or play your message on our next episode. Hideo Kojima denies creating Metal Gear Survive. Forza Horizon 3 drifts in next week. And a game developer is suing Steam customers for $18 million. Find out why, plus this week's new game releases, announcements, and more. It's Friday, September 23rd, 2016, and you're listening to the 1P vs. 2P Podcast. I'm Taylor Ray. I'm Ryan Ray. And this week, we're actually going to start off with some listener feedback. Uh, first one comes in from... Dragonite spam on our last episode on our YouTube channel. So thank you for this. This is in reference to a story that we covered at the top of last week's episode, uh, all about uh, Steam Valve changing the way it displays its user reviews by default. Uh, Steps in the right direction. Maybe someday Valve will even be able to filter out unhelpful reviews that just fish for upvotes and float to the top anyway. Well, They've already had updates since we started talking about it on our show last week. Uh, Since then, Valve decided that uh, after some feedback, especially from a lot of developers, after the story sort of uh, picked up some steam, no pun intended, essentially they, they changed their policy again. So what they said is, quote, one frequent piece of feedback we've heard regarding the recent changes is that it's become more difficult to find and read the helpful, articulate reviews written by customers that obtain the game outside of Steam. We want to make sure that helpful reviews can be surfaced regardless of purchase source, so we're making a change to the default. Starting today, the review section on each product page will show reviews written by all users, regardless of purchase type. By default, you'll now see reviews written by all players of the game, including Steam customers, Kickstarter backers, bundle customers, streamers, and other users that acquired the game outside of Steam. Ryan, what do you think about that? Uh, I would just add uh, quickly that their uh, update didn't actually address the review score attached to it. The, just the re- the content of the reviews themselves um, won't be delineated into where the uh, game key actually came from. However, the score associated with it will continue to be based exclusively uh, from people who have purchased the game from Steam. So um, if you're actually reading the content of their uh, review, not going to be filtered out. Uh, however, the score, you know, again, we talked about their their system. It's a very positive, positive, um, neutral, uh, negative, or very negative. Uh, that rating will continue to be only for, uh, be surfaced only for people who've made their uh, game purchase through Steam. And um, I think this is Valve, uh, you know, listening to some of the feedback that some of the developers and gamers have uh, come back at them after they made this change. Um, it's good they're listening. Um, I am unsure that this is the the full breadth and depth that people really wanted, but it seems to be like a half step between, um, everything that was being, uh, asked for. So, uh, good on them for listening. Yeah. And I don't really know if there's any perfect way to really sort of counter all these like kind of fraudulent reviews that, um, some shady developers, uh, encourages users to put up there. I don't think there's really like a great way to like combat that that sort of artificial system uh, that people use Steam to to game with. I don't know. I I do have to say, though, I I think it's it's a good thing that Valve sort of backtracked a little bit to not punish um, those sellers who uh, had a lot of Kickstarter backers, for instance. And then all of a sudden, you know, their reviews weren't being seen at all. I think uh, our listener Dragonite Spam brought up a very good point is that it's hard to sort of filter out right now still those really crappy like one line uh, joke or meme style reviews that don't have anything substantial to say about the game. Um, And then they get upvoted all the way to the top, you know, it gets a bunch of thumbs up. And then all of a sudden we see it right there on the front of the store page uh, for any given game. It's really kind of obnoxious and not helpful to anyone. It's more like a like a a forum uh, post uh, that that's oftentimes what 
the those store reviews, um, those Steam reviews seem to turn into. So if there was a way Valve could address that, that would I think be another positive thing they could do. Well, let's let's transition into the next story, which is actually another uh, update with Steam. A game developer is suing 100 anonymous Steam users for 18 million dollars. So the game developer here in question is Digital Homicide. Uh, if you have heard of this game studio before, uh, they are perhaps infamous for uh, previously suing game critic Jim Sterling for $10 million. Uh, Jim Sterling, of course, uh, formerly of Destructoid. He has his own YouTube channel called The Jimquisition. He reviews a lot of games, does a lot of games criticism. Uh, In the past, Digital Homicide has charged uh, Sterling with uh, libel and slander for harshly criticizing their games. That lawsuit is still pending. Uh, But currently, Digital Homicide is now pursuing legal action against 100 Steam users, calling them a hate and harassment group in recent court filings. So let me talk a little bit about the specific details of this new lawsuit filed in Arizona earlier this week. Um, Digital Homicide was founded by two brothers. Uh, One of the the two brothers, uh, co-founder James James Romine, asked for about $18 million from users with handles like Demon Sword and Nathos. Uh, The suit, which uh, asks the court to subpoena Valve for the identities of these users, lays out a large list of allegations, some of them including stalking, harassment, criminal impersonation, interference, so on and so forth. And it it got to a point where uh, the digital homicide was monitoring all these users and uh, the group the users was accusing digital homicide of basically spamming Steam Greenlight, trying to get their basically crap games onto the service and trying to more or less defraud users. There were some stolen assets also implicated in the, in the studio's games. Some games that really look like subpar mobile versions of games. Uh, g- yeah, game- it's a lot of shovelware. A lot, a lot of shovelware. The Steam group in question uh, was originally called Poop Games and has now have been relabeled to Digital Homicides. And uh, they decided to go after all these users, and we will see what what comes of this. Uh, In response, Valve has gone ahead and delisted all of Digital Homicide's games from the platform uh, trying to defend their users, saying that we're not going to tolerate lawsuits against our users. We're trying to d- defend people who are purchasing games from our service. Taylor, what do you make of all this legal action? And what do you make of Valve trying to step in and defend the users? It's really high time that they started policing what goes on in Steam Greenlight and what is being curated, what is being highlighted uh, in their own store. I mean, We've talked about this time and time again about, Ryan, you described it as a libertarian approach to Steam. Valve takes this very hands-off approach to a lot of things, and we end up with situations like this where it gets really, really out of hand, and all of a sudden you have a developer being pitted against its own customers, and it's a horrible, horrible situation. Um, I don't feel like anyone really wins here. Uh, Valve looks bad. Digital Homicides looks bad. All these Steam users look bad. And someone who put it really, really well was Nathan Grayson, who put up this editorial on Kotaku um, and highlighted a lot of the reasons why this lawsuit was really sort of Valve's fault. And uh, he said a couple of points. Number one, Valve refused to curate Steam in meaningful and consistent ways, except when things reach a breaking point and the damage is already done, like I said before. And then number two, Valve allows and systematically endorses Steam users to behave in ways that are toxic, verging on abuse with developers and each other. So, yeah, I, I, I couldn't agree more more with those statements. Um, it's just really, really an ugly situation. Uh, and they should have removed G- Digital Homicide's games a long, long time ago. Obviously, you can't look at them now. But if you trust me, I took a look at some of them earlier this week um, while this was still happening, right before Valve decided to remove all their games uh, from Steam and they looked horrendous. <laughs> I just want to bring up two more points and then we can move on. Uh, I think the third third point here really is that Valve is also benefiting monetarily from having more games available on its platform, right? They take a, a cut from every game that's sold on Steam. So regardless of how they actually feel about the quality of games that are being published on its service, Valve is making a cut uh, regardless uh, based on how much is being sold and they've made money off of digital homicides, crap games. And now they're turning around and shutting off the valve. I think that's kind of digital homicides point in all of this. If you're op- having a free and open marketplace, you know, it's, it's kind of uh, hypocritical to on one hand denounce 
the actions of one developer and game publisher uh, while trying to continue to make money off of them. And the last point on this is that also, you know, this might set a legal precedent. We, as video gamers, as as people who are in the sort of journalism world, you know, we write reviews, we give opinions, and sometimes games are crap. Uh, we We have a more or less obligation to tell our audiences that, right? And <laughs> if this sets a legal precedent in which uh, developers and publishers can uh, basically sue anybody who, uh, whether it's a game game developer, uh, a person in the game journalism world, or your average consumer and saying that this game is crap and putting it in a public forum, uh, if we can get sued for saying like that, then we're not going to actually know in the future what games are actually crap and which ones are actually worth paying for. And I think that's a really dangerous precedent to set. Uh, I hope that this lawsuit gets thrown out on the merits. And if it does get taken to trial, I hope uh, we we root for Valve because, frankly, uh, it, if we live in a future where the digital homicide uh, version of, of things wins out, uh, you know, we could potentially be sued for libel or slander for saying that a game is bad. And I don't think that's a future I want to be a part of. Yeah, I'm no lawyer. You're not a lawyer. But I have a strong feeling this kind of lawsuit is going to get thrown out. Jim Sterling, I think, you know, love him or hate him being sort of the first to really deal with this kind of situation um, really opens our eyes to this kind of thing. And um, if developers and publishers have the right to to censor the audience, to censor critics, it's really, really a bleak future. I don't think it's going to happen, but if it does, man, that, that would be a huge, huge nightmare to try to police everywhere, not just through Steam reviews, through Steam groups, but even on places like YouTube and Twitter, uh, it's just it, it's just bad. It's bad. And hopefully it, it won't come to that. This lawsuit's going to get thrown out. Let's move on to a bit of sad news. It's not super important, but still sad nonetheless. Blizzard is killing the name Battle.net. That's the name they've used um, for their internet platform since 1996. Long time. Um, what are we going to call this thing from now on? Um, you know, ever since I remember playing... Um, Diablo 2, uh, Warcraft 2, even before that, online using, you know, 56K, a dial-up modem. We always knew that the the multiplayer service that uh, Blizzard hosted called Battle.net was a great name. And all of a sudden, they've taken this uh, approach. They said to this announcement that um, there won't be a new name. They're not going to replace the name Battle.net. The company says they're just going to refer it to as Blizzard Tech. But nonetheless, isn't this sad? I think this is sad. Battle.net represents uh, an era of of gaming that's uh, long far gone. You know, the idea of Battle.net in the in the first place was kind of a, like a tailored matchmaking service that that was really like revolutionary at its time. Um, you know, it it kind of gave it a distinct name. It it helped people connect. It it helped create kind of like two separate identities, right? If you were playing a Blizzard game, you knew it was going to be associated with Battle.net. Um, I think it's one of the great, like, few few things that, like, video game names have actually, like, super been important about. Like, I think matchmaking is kind of, like, a vague name that that could kind of mean a few different things. Battle.net is, like, is like I <laughs> imagine if... Xbox Live or PSN was called Battle.net, right? Like most multi online multiplayer games are exactly that. You're battling people over the internet, right? Like that that was like a super novel concept at the time. Uh, you know, the launcher for a long time for uh, StarCraft, Warcraft, World of Warcraft, all of Blizzard's properties has been Battle.net. It's it was part of their storefront. And it's it's crazy to me that they're changing it, that they're just going to make it a very generic brand name. Man, this is a Battle.net is like takes me back that that product is about 20 years old. It's good to see that Blizzard is still with us. Uh, they're one of the few companies from that era that still kind of um, continue to be innovative in this space. But man alive, I'm going to miss the name Battle.net. Yeah, it's really, really iconic. I'm sure it had to do with some weird corporate decision. But yeah, it evokes all these really nostalgic feelings inside. And yeah, I hate to see it go. 
And uh, without much justification, personally, all right, we'll move on because there's not much else to say about it. Let's move on to a weird sort of story. Um, Hideo Kojima denying any involvement with the new Metal Gear game, uh, which is called Metal Gear Survive, involving um, zombies uh, as a multiplayer game. At Tokyo Game Show, Hideo Kojima briefly talked about it and how he has absolutely nothing to do with it. Uh, during this audience Q&A, he was asked if the rumor was true that Metal Gear Survive was his idea, and then he responded, quote, It has nothing to do with me. I know absolutely nothing about it. Well, for me, Metal Gear is espionage with political fiction, right? So because of that, there's no reasons that zombies would show up, end quote. Of course, this was all translated from Japanese, but... Nonetheless, here we go. Definitively, we know he has no involvement, so it has to be bad. Right, Ryan? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, what's kind of amazing about the whole Kojima Konami saga is that basically everybody, everybody who was following the story, every, all those fan theories, like, eventually bore out, right? Like, we knew Konami was going to crap out like a pachinko game. Now we know that they're probably going to crap out a uh, zombie survival game based on the same IP, right? Like the the Fox engine that was used to make um, Ground Zeroes and Metal Gear 5 was expensive. And it turned out to be, a, a that game turned out to be a real critical success, but it may not have been a financial one for Konami. So <laughs> it's no surprise that they're trying to reuse this ass, the, their assets to uh, make another game out of it. But uh, I just, <laughs> I, I just continue to shake my head. I think we were right. In I was recently listening to our uh, 2015 Game of the Year awards, and we did uh, award the uh, that this whole saga our like biggest story of the year, and it just continues to pay di- dividends. Like, I, like just stop all the drama, right? All the yeah. drama, just stop, just stop. Like, and Kojima wants it to stop. He wants to move on. He wants to move on with his life. He's working on a new game called Death Stranding. Konami continues to want to like play play the, this fine line. It's like, well, K- Kojima didn't really want to like put his stamp on it, but his ideas were kind of sort of his. Who, who I don't know who put the that rumor uh, out on him in the first place, but. I'm glad he's finally putting it to rest. Let, let's all move on. And the sooner Metal Gear Survive comes out and, and we decide whether it's a good or bad game or not, we can sooner move on from Metal Gear as a franchise at all. I, I agree with him that Metal Gear is really about espionage with political fiction. It has to have an actual walking robot nuclear tank to, to be <laughs> called Metal Gear, right? That's the whole premise of the thing. Uh, without that, I it might as well be Left 4 Dead 3. You know, Metal Gear Survive, I think a better title for that would be Metal Gear, We Really Jumped the Shark, because that's what I feel like it is. Like, <laughs> it's totally bonkers premise. You know, we, we don't know uh, much about the gameplay, but all we know is is the, this premise, the title, Kojima not involved with it. Have a healthy, healthy dose of skepticism when we talk about this game, because I certainly am. I really don't trust Konami with continuing the Metal Gear uh, vision and success that Hideo Kojima really injected into it. It really was his creative baby. Let's move on to our new video game releases. I love new releases. Some from this past week and some for next week, starting off with Destiny Rise of Iron. Uh, this is the last expansion uh, coming out on Xbox One and PS4. Bungie has stated from the get-go that Rise of Iron won't be as meaty as Taken King, which was actually $40 compared to Iron's $30. Um, Ryan, you played a ton of Taken King, didn't you? I did. I That was my jumping back point into Destiny. Uh, you and I played Destiny when it first started, uh, and then we kind of uh, trailed off, as I think a lot of people did with Destiny, when you found out that a lot of the content you were playing to grind uh, new gear and new light levels uh, was, was just repeated content. It wasn't fun. It wasn't fun. It felt the base game of Destiny just felt super incomplete. Right. And then the two expansions that they did after that, uh, House of Wolves, and I forget, I'm forgetting the name of the other one, uh, were very like incremental upgrades. They added a few missions, didn't really do very much. They also added two new story raids. Uh, Taken King was kind of like, a, a true like PC level expansion of the game. Uh, that was when Destiny got good again. Uh, it had a very interesting story, uh, new enemy faction called the Taken, and uh, the raid was actually very good. Uh, that was it got me to participate in a, in a raid, and I've never done that in an MMO style game before. And uh, I loved the Taken King's content. And uh, 
you know, Rise of Iron it, it seems to be their last effort to try to get a little bit more money out of Destiny players before uh, they move on, move everybody on to Destiny 2, try to be a reboot. Because remember, again, when they uh, pitched Destiny to all of us, they said, this is going to be an MMO with long legs. It's going to be a 10-year pl- content plan. And right now we're in year three of Destiny. And so far, uh, that 10-year plan looks kind of long in the tooth. So, so far, Rise of Iron is promising a new story campaign. It's going to be a few missions, a new raid that actually unlocks today. Uh, that raid is being called Wrath of the Machine. Uh, basically, the the story around this uh, expansion is basically a virus has taken over uh, one of the original factions of the game, and it is reusing some of the same uh, levels and biomes from the original Destiny, which I can't believe they're recycling more content for this game. I mean, I can't believe it because that's what they've been doing this entire time. Uh, <laughs> the the actual uh, exciting part, I think, for a lot of people who are still playing Destiny is that uh, they are including um, more exotic weapons, more loot. Uh, the loot has system has gotten a little bit better. Uh, the random drops come more frequently. It is a little bit easier to increase your light level and actually become raid-ready. And, uh, you know, I think with this expansion, Destiny has finally become a full-fledged game. I just think it's quite a shame that three years into Destiny, it took this long to put in content to the game that uh, had it been there from the start, I think the conversation around Destiny would have been completely different, right? Like if we had had all these expansions, all this, all this like, maybe have the DLC like like maybe only two DLC packs instead of four and have more of that, that base game have uh, beefier from the start. Like we would all be continue to be playing destiny, right? Like I think the gunplay in it is super good. I think there's some really interesting stuff around destiny, but the way that content kind of got staggered out from the gate and the way that they reused a lot of the same missions, the way you had to kind of like grind out loot and basically play the same three strikes over and over and over and over again, I think really killed it for a lot of people. Well, and then on top of it, you have this new Destiny The Collection Edition, which is out now on PS4 and Xbox One. It's the $60 bundle that has the base game and all DLC, including this latest one, Rise of Iron. So if you were looking to jump into Destiny, that's probably the best way to do it because Rise of Iron on its own is $30, so you might as well spend the $60 to get everything, all the DLC leading up into this point. But you know, you're, you're absolutely right. I completely agree with you. It, it just was... Super, super disappointing um, how repetitive, um, how much of the story was just missing from the vanilla version of the game. And had this DLC either come out uh, sooner or was available for free or was a little bit more substantial without recycling the same areas, the same content over and over and over again. I remember the first couple of weeks we were playing that game, the loot drops were just incredibly, incredibly bad. And that is sort of defeats the whole purpose of... Uh, replaying a really good loot driven game. You know, it, I think games like Diablo do this extremely well. They keep those hooks in there. And if it's not there, if it doesn't keep players from coming back, they patch it in quickly to allow for better drops much more frequently. Something they did with Diablo 3 and Destiny Bungie, they just took way too long to recognize that. So I will not be playing Rise of Iron. Um, from what I've heard, Taking King was probably the best DLC uh, leading up to this point. But yeah, it's unfortunate. Perhaps we should just write this all off and wait for Destiny 2, like they said that they're going to be making. It's been uh, rumored uh, in development for a while now. Let's move on to a new IP, Virginia, out now on PS4, Xbox One, and PC. Virginia takes place in the rural town of Kingdom, Virginia, where there's this mysterious disappearance of a young boy, Lucas Fairfax, spinning off an investigation with the FBI. Um, you play this really fresh FBI graduate, uh, investigating this case. This game is really all about, um, story moments, cinematic sequences, you know, really like disjointed timelines. It seems very intriguing. It's getting a lot of critical praise so far might be worth looking into. So check out our show notes, uh, for a link to Virginia. Yeah. This game is getting compared, uh, I think very favorably to, uh, that game that came out a while back, Dear Esther, uh, which is also kind of a game, um, a lot like this, uh, you know, story, story moments, you control the character, uh, going back and forth between timelines. And uh, it's also being, uh, compared to that TV series Twin Peaks uh, as far as uh, the premise and kind of the oddities that you're seeing. Uh, I think those are that's a very intriguing premise for a game. There have been a lot of these kind of, uh, you know, first-person, third-person, um, story-based 
adventure games. Uh, Firewatch came out earlier this year. Uh, that Dragon Cancer also came out earlier this year. Uh, I think this is a format that has become super popular since the release of games like Gone Home and uh, Her Story last year. And, uh, you know, if, if Virginia is as promising as the reviews make it out to be, I'm definitely super interested in, in this kind of gameplay. Moving on to Forza Horizon 3 for Xbox One and PC. So get this, if you uh, purchase the special edition, the game is out today for you. Otherwise, you'll have to wait until Tuesday, the 27th, uh, for everyone else. Ryan, you're a fan of the Forza Horizon games. I want you to tell me what you think of this game so far based on what you've seen uh, and the reviews you've read. Um, Because for me, I'm looking to get this game right now. It looks awesome phenomenal so far yeah from what i've seen the the game's uh setting in australia this time is like the perfect setting for an open world uh, racing game uh i think the original forza horizon did a lot of people a lot of favors uh, by being kind of the sort of arcade uh style take on the simulation uh style racing that the mainline forza series already did and uh you know the first game took place in colorado that had a kind of like a lot of open fields and a lot of like um you know, turny hills and a lot of great spots to actually do races in. I think Forza Horizon 2 uh, continued that same tradition, but was a little less exciting in uh, parts of Europe, I would say, like the Netherlands and Scandinavia. A lot of, like, more narrow paths wasn't wasn't as exciting. And I think, the, from what I've seen of the previews and reviews of Forza Horizon 3, uh, they've added a lot to bring people back into the folds. Uh, they've added dune buggies. They've added pickup trucks on top of the already like massive library of cars that you can uh, choose from to drive in this game. And the game looks beautiful. We're, we're living in an era where we're talking about uh, new TV standards. Uh, HDR is is going, going to continue to be a thing. And right now, if you have an Xbox One S and a TV that uh, lives up to that HDR standard, uh, you're looking at a very colorful, beautiful looking game. I would definitely look for this game on a lot of like best looking games for a uh, game of the year. It just looks very colorful, a uh, world that looks very lived in. And this is a car game that we're talking about. This isn't like uh, Grand Theft Auto or anything like that. It just looks... Gorgeous from the screenshots. On top of it, Forza Horizon 3 isn't the first game that is uh, taking advantage of Microsoft's new uh, Xbox Play Anywhere program, but it is probably going to be one of the ones that is talked about the most um, because you, if you buy an Xbox One version of this game or the PC version of the game, you get the other platforms version of the game for free. So uh, if you buy a Xbox One version of the game, you get a copy uh, on the Windows 10 store for free, Taylor. And I think that's going to do a lot of favors for people who are um, interested in playing the game in two different spaces. I know for me, I uh, famously sold my Xbox One. I am looking forward to playing this game on the PC where the graphics are probably going to be a little bit better and the loading times are probably going to be a little bit better. And (laughs) I'm just so looking forward to playing this game when it comes out on Tuesday. Uh, Oh, Oh my God, I, I I love these kinds of games. There also sort of seems to be these conflicting reports on whether PC players who bought it from the Windows 10 store uh, will need Xbox Live Gold to play online, but Microsoft has said they will not. So there, there are conflicting reports out there. Some people saying it's required, Microsoft saying not. I just think that the Xbox Play Anywhere program is uh, excellent. It's phenomenal. There are cases where you know, my living room TV where my Xbox one is hooked up is just uh, taken up. My wife's watching something and, uh, I would prefer to play something on PC. Well, now you can do that at no extra cost. Uh, I think that's uh, amazing. It's going to bring more and more people to try out Forza Horizon three as one of the, the first games, uh, in this pilot program. So, uh, yeah, but just as far as the gameplay goes, looks stunning. You're driving through uh, jungle areas, deserts, beach, uh, beachy sort of style areas. Phenomenal. Looks gorgeous. I'm really excited to check it out. Love arcade racers over the simulation style uh, racers like Gran Turismo, like the Forza Motorsport mainline series. So uh, I might be checking this one out very, very soon. Uh, last but not least, we have FIFA 17 out on Xbox One. PS4, PS3, 360, and PC uh, on Tuesday, the 27th. Not much to say about it beyond the fact that they're including a brand new story mode with an original character. You're you're playing as a fictional prodigy, Alex Hunter, in a mode called The Journey. 
And early reviews for this game says that the, the team AI has been much, much improved, much more accurately reflects the strategy of real world teams. So if you're looking for something more realistic, looks like FIFA 17 fits the bill. Yeah, and uh, it seems to be uh, continuing in the tradition of trying to stomp out the competition. Of course, this is EA's product. The uh, other soccer product available for purchase is uh, the Konami's uh, Winning Eleven uh it's pro evolution soccer, right? It's oh, been a long time since winning 11. I'm sorry. Pro evolution <laughs> soccer. Right. But I think, uh, the masses have widely accepted that FIFA, uh, the FIFA games are really the, uh, soccer games of record. Uh, so if you're interested in sports games and you're a big soccer fan, check out FIFA 17 On to new game announcements. Here comes a new challenger. Not a lot that got revealed last week, but we've highlighted one. Yono is a game in the style of a classic top down legend of Zelda, but it stars a very, very, very cute elephant. What's it about, Ryan? Yeah, so this game is uh, it has combat, it has puzzles, uh, treasure hunts, as well as, quote, delicate cultural and political situations, which I'm not sure how you resolve those as an elephant, but uh, maybe (laughs) maybe (laughs) maybe Dumbo is getting political. Uh, (laughs) Anyway, uh, the game's going to include humans, zombies, and robots, and uh, it looks like it's coming out on PC. Uh, We'll link the trailer in our show notes. It has a very, very cute uh, aesthetic. It seems to be kind of an isometric style gameplay, and... uh, Man, uh, people can't get away from this like elephant as main protagonist, right? We had like Tembo the badass elephant uh, last year, and we've had a number of uh, games recently that have had <laughs> elef- elephants as as mainline characters. So, uh, looking forward to a more cutesy take on the Legend of Zelda with uh, this elephant game. Elephant's so hot right now. <laughs> All right, uh, it's kind of a slow news week, so we're gonna wrap it up with our bonus stage items. Ryan, you ready for it? Yeah, let's do it. Destiny player Tiger Shark Dude asked the Destiny game subreddit to help petition Bungie to add additional subtitle options for random NPC dialogue and for assistance with the raids because he's deaf. As a result, he asked the Destiny the game subreddit to help petition Bungie to make the game's subtitle options much more robust. Bungie's community manager Cosmo responded that making the game more accessible for deaf players will be a consideration for the future. I think a lot of game developers should continue to make more accessibility options for game gamers who are disabled, who are deaf, who are colorblind. So let's let's get on let's get on board with this petition. A new study confirms that people love to play Pokemon Go while driving. This from JAMA Internal Medicine. The study searched for Twitter posts and Google News reports that included words like Pokemon driving a car, reviewing the data, and from the study, I'm going to quote it here, 33% of tweets indicated that a driver, passenger, or pedestrian was distracted by the game, suggesting there were just 114,000 total incidences reported on Twitter in just 10 days. During that same time, there were apparently 14 different reported car crashes that involved playing Pokemon Go. I can't believe this is a thing. I mean, seriously, people, Pokemon Go, it, I mean, come on, it can wait. I don't care. Just get out, stop, get out of your car, park. Uh, don't affect traffic. Don't endanger your life over something so, so stupid, all right? Now off my soapbox. YouTuber YBR tried to play Overwatch's Lucio using two turntables from DJ Hero. He mapped movement to the left turntable and aiming to the right while shooting and special abilities linked to the buttons on either one. He wasn't able to work out all the kinks of the setups because the game's uh, speed mode means Lucio automatically walks forward. As Lucio said, let's break it down. Well, well, we just did. What are you talking about? (laughs) (laughs) All right, that's it. Remember to listen and subscribe to our show, the 1P vs. 2P podcast, wherever you listen to podcasts, including iTunes, Stitcher, Google Play Music, Tune in or clamor or bookmark our site, 1pvs2p.com. Our sources for this week's stories have been posted at the link in the show notes, but don't forget to like us on Facebook, subscribe to our YouTube channel, and follow us on Twitter. Uh, We're very active there at 1pvs2p underscore podcast. As always, we want to thank Phonetic Hero for the use of his songs for our show, Coffee Stomp and Super Manly Brothers X. Both songs are part of the compilation project, Chip Tunes Equals Win. I'm Taylor Ray. That's my co-host, Ryan Ray. Thanks for listening. See you next week. Oh, let's break it down!